for one hour session. So the last 15 minutes will be like, um, I guess for general QA for everyone. All right, I think we're at time. So let's just go ahead and start then. So hi everyone, my name is August Shi. I'm from UT Austin and I will be the session chair for today's XT demo session on software testing. Uh, so we have three great presentations lined up. Uh, so quick reminder, five minute uh, main presentation followed by 10 minutes of live demo and a bit of Q&A for each presentation. And then for the remaining time after everyone has gone, we'll uh, have kind of opened the floor for just general questions uh, for all three presentations. So let's go ahead and start uh, So with uh, Xiao on the first talk on Jay Marker. So go ahead and take it away. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our TOT marker, a uh, refactoring test to production inheritance by UC Mercado. Uh, I'm Xiao, and this is a collaborative work among Lu, Tingting, Annie, and Sony, and me. So, so first, I will briefly talk about uh, mocking and unit tests. And then I will talk about the motivation of our work. Then I will go through the methodology of GMarker, and finally, I will demo how to install and use GMarker. So software unit test is a very important process in software development. It focuses on verifying the behavior of a certain unit of function. And the unique challenge in unit test is that the software elements are interdependent on each other. So the key for creating high quality unit test is to isolate the function under test with other dependencies. In practice, this is achieved through mocking. So basically, developer replace the dependencies by creating a fake object. However, despite the existence of powerful dedicated mocking frameworks, developers often create a subclass of the dependent class and mock its behavior through method overriding. This requires tedious implementation and compromises the design quality of any test. For example, if a developer turns to use inheritance to create the thick object, he needs to create a subclass that overrides the methods of the dependent functions and use the subclass as a thick object to help test. In this particular example, developers need to create a, a subclass that extends the parent class email manager, and they created two fields, subscribe and non, to keep tracking the execution status of these two methods, subscribe and send email. Later in the test case, developer create an instance of the mocked object and pass it to the test target. Last in the assertion statement, developer use the um, fields created in the mocked object to assert the master execution status of the mocked object. So um, this is a procedure of using inheritance for creating the mock object. Um, if developers choose to use Mercato to implement mocking, it will be much more easier. They can easily create the mocking object by using Mercato and control the behavior by using the method stop. They no longer need to create the test subclass, thus decouple the test code from the production code. Developer can directly verify the execution status of the mocking object to make test condition more explicit and improve the test design by enforcing a AAA test design pattern. So you can find the detailed description of this motivation example in our paper. So how to transfer the inheritance mock to Mercato mock? Uh, basically, you can use our 2J marker. Uh, it can automatically detect the test to production inheritance and automatically refactor it with Mercato. So GMarker contains two main components. The first one is identify the refactoring candidate. The second one is to automatically generate the refactoring solution. So uh, regarding to the uh, identify refactoring candidates, since some of the cases are not feasible for refactoring due to Mercator's limitation or complicated design, the first component is uh, to identify the refactoring candidates by filtering out the cases that cannot be refactored based on the knowledge gained from our empirical study. And then the second step is to automatically generate a refactoring solution. So the automatic refactoring can be formalized a conversion from the left side to the right side. The left side represents the code before refactoring, the right side represents the code after refactoring. 
So you can see here, after the refactoring, the attributes and the construction will be translated to the construction of the mock object in the test case. And the override method will be translated to the method stop in the test case. And all the reference to the original test uh, um, subclass will be translated to the reference to the mocking object in the test case. So um, this is a basic uh, log uh, methodology of GMocker. So how to uh, install and use GMocker, I will show you a quick demo for this part. Um, so first, uh, GMarker is an Eclipse plugin. So in order to use that, you need to first have an Eclipse IDE, right? Then uh, once you have uh, your Eclipse IDE, you can directly go to this Git repository. And this repository has been mentioned in the abstract section in our paper. So um, what you need to do is just go to the desktop and just quickly from the gate repository in the uh, desktop. Then uh, you can directly open your IDE, Eclipse IDE, and install the GMarker by providing the uh, gate repository you just cloned. So, um, yeah. So after calculating the requirements and the dependencies, it will automatically uh, installed into Eclipse. Um, so uh, then I will show you how to use uh, GMarker. So this example is comes from the open source project, which is a uh, JackRabbit, and you can find it in the GitHub. Um, let me first finish the installing process. Okay. So as I mentioned before, JMarker works in two different stages. The first stage is to identify the refactoring candidates. In this stage, you can select uh, different software entities, such like a few software uh, source files, or a few packages, or the entire project as the input for the detection. Um, for example, if you select uh, you know, a few software packages, after selecting these packages, you can right-click the uh, packages and go to the mock refactor section and hit the detect the mock refactoring candidate, it will automatically scan all the test files inside of this uh, uh, software entity. In this case, it's inside of these uh, you know, software packages and it will return you a list of the potential refactoring candidates. So as uh, in this example, we have two candidates, right? The first one is from the simple cluster context class and uh, it is, the very same class, which is a simple cluster context. And the second one comes from the consistency check implementation test. And the test class involved in this instance is a test update event listener class. Um, okay, so uh, this is the first step to detect the uh, refactoring candidate. The second step is to implement the refactoring, right? So in this example, I will show you how to implement the refactoring actually uh, in this very example, I will just detect the inheritance, uh, test to production inheritance inside this source file. And it will show you that, uh, well, in, in the selected software entities, it just contain one uh, refraction candidate is this test action, right? Uh, so you cannot select the uh, refraction candidates. And you have two options right now. So the first option is to preview the you know, the refactoring solution before you implement, or you can directly click the start refactoring to directly implement the refactoring without previewing them. If you click this preview the refactoring, it will return you a list of the affected source files because sometimes if you refactor one test up class, it will involve multiple, you know, test files as the test up class could be used in these multiple test files, right? In this case, it just uh, involved it this one test file. And you can click the preview button and it will automatically show you the default, right? So in this example, uh, before uh, the left side represent the code before the refactoring and the right side represent the code after refactoring. As you can see here, uh, after the refactoring, the test subclass, this test action 
has been completely removed. And the corresponding creation of the test subclass is inside of this uh, you know, test case, right? Uh, now has been replaced to the uh, spy of the parent class. And later in the assertion statement, the uh, original assertion statement is, um, is to assert the value of this card um, fields to make sure that the uh, execution status of this on password change. And now the assertion statement has been replaced to the Mercator Verify function. So um, by using Mercator Verify, developers can directly verify the behavior of the uh, methods. In this case, it's an on password change. They directly verify that after this test target has been executed, the on password change has been executed at exactly once. And after this line of code, the on password change has been executed exactly twice. So after reviewing the you know, difference um, before and after refactoring, you can, you can click the start refactoring to directly implement the refactoring. As you can see here, the refactoring has been successfully implemented to this file. Um, well, I think that's it. Uh, that is the basic logic of how to install and use GMarker. Uh, thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much, Shao. Um, I guess we have some time. I guess this is for live demo and a bit of Q and A. So any specific questions about this part, and we'll have more time after everyone presentation to have some more general questions as well. So I guess we can open the floor for kind of the audience to have questions, or anybody of the other authors have questions as well. Um, <clears throat> I can ask a question. So I, I'm just a little curious again uh, <clears throat> on how exactly actually it finds kind of the code changes to do for the refactoring. Um, I kind of missed that maybe from the demo a bit. You mean uh, what is the difference before the refactoring and after refactoring? No, how does it find what to, re like how does it find what changes to make in order to do the refactoring? Oh, I see. I see, I got it. So, um, Regarding to this part, actually, uh, if you take a look at this uh, automatic refactoring, sorry, I should do this. Bit. Yeah, if you take a look at this transformation, right, uh, this listed the code before refactoring and the code after refactoring. Actually, the um, you know the the basic implementation is rely on the AST and the symbol resolver. So basically, we will we will first detect uh, where the where the you know, test subclass being used and how it being used in the test case. Then based on this knowledge, we are going to uh, you know, translate, the mock uh, translate the test subclass instance into the mock object through the Mercator. So, um, and the detailed logic is actually uh, rely on our empirical study. So based on, on our empirical study, we observed some patterns that we can be used to you know, to actually uh, implement this process. Uh, and the detailed implementation is described in our paper. So if you're interested, you can definitely refer to the paper. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess from looking at your slide more, right, it just seems like kind of there's, it identifies, you know, some stuff as attributes, some stuff as kind of creating a new class. But uh, I guess what I'm trying to, one, what I'm wondering here is, are there any, I guess, cases for kind of, this before code where it would have kind of maybe some problems doing this labeling correctly and then consequently wouldn't be able to kind of do this refactoring correctly. Oh, uh, yeah, yes, yes, I understand. Yeah, definitely there will be some corner cases that we cannot capture all the, you know, possible scenarios in our empirical study. And this, if these corner cases happen, it could possibly uh, affect the refactoring, the code after refactoring. Maybe the code after refactoring won't compile. And this part of discussion is also included in our paper. So basically, we uh, we observe the refactoring patterns based on the training data set, right? Then we implement our tool in the testing data set. And we, uh, we, we want to, you know, measure how general ability of this, um, of this approach that we observed in the empirical study. Okay, and maybe yeah. just again, last question here. So in this case, kind of the training and testing data set, you guys like manually labeled it? How did you obtain this data set to begin with? 
uh, you mean how how did we select the projects for the training and testing data set? Well, how did you get labeled data kind of for kind of oh, what I the see. right transformation is before and after kind of? Oh, okay, I see. So, um, so the criteria of, uh, you know, uh, determining determine whether the, you know, refraction is succeed or field is, uh, is only based on the, whether the test could, uh, uh, could be executed, successfully executed after the refraction. And also, um, it does not contain any compiled time error, right? So we, for the labeling, uh, you know, process, we do not have any labeling process because uh, the, the source of truth is just the execution status of each test cases. Okay, exactly. that's fine. Thanks for your answers. Yes. All right, yeah, thank sure. you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank yes, you, Chow. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll have more time for questions at the end as well. Um, but now let's move on to uh, De giving us a presentation on uh, Mobic. Okay. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Zhe Chen from Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. I'm going to present MOVIC, a dynamic analysis tool for the memory safety of C programs. Uh, as we know, memory errors may lead to program crashes and uh, security vulnerabilities. Typical memory errors include uh, special errors, temporal errors, segment confusion errors, and the memory leaks. These include uh, the usually said buffer overflows and uh, use after freeze. In this demo, we will present a tool that can automatically detect all these memory errors at runtime. You may already know some existing tools, for example, Google's address sanitizer and uh, Wiregrain. However, these existing tools suffers from three limitations. The first limitation is the low effectiveness because they can't deterministically and uh, completely detect some errors. The second limitation is optimization sensitivity. They can detect some errors when compiler optimizations are turned off, but not at a higher optimization level. The third limitation is about platform dependence because they don't support some operating systems and some ISAs. To, uh, to, um, to solve these uh, three limitations, we have proposed a new methodology and uh, implemented a new tool named the MOVIC. Uh, MOVIC uses a smart, a smart status-based monitoring algorithm and a source-level instrumentation framework. We have published two ISTA papers on this new methodology. If you are interested in the technical details, you can find these two papers. Here I give you a very, a very simple example to demonstrate the principle of our methodology. This is a very simple C program. It defines a structure named ST, and this structure contains two members, M1 and M2. Then in the main function, uh, the program defines a variable of the type ST. At this time, the program allocates a memory block in the memory, uh, for example, from the address 3000 to the address 3016. Uh, at this time, at runtime, our tool will create a status node for this variable. The status node includes two fields. One is the status of this uh, memory object, and the other is the reference count. Here, the status is stuck because this variable uh, is in the stack. The reference count, the initial value, is 1. Then the program assigns the address of M1 to the pointer P. At this time, our tool will create a pointer metadata for the pointer P. The metadata includes the base and the bound of the memory block that can be legally accessed by this pointer. It also contains a pointer to the status node in order to increase the reference count. For example, here we increase the reference count from 1 to 2. Then the program tries to dereference this pointer with a array subscript expression. So you can see the access the location is outside the check the legitimate range. So an error is detected and reported at the runtime. 
So you can see from the figure, the most uh, critical structure of our approach included the metadata and the status node. We can detect a variety of memory errors. The tool can detect spatial errors with the check based on the bound information. It can detect temporal errors and the segment confusion errors with the checked status. And finally, it can detect memory leaks on the spot with the checked reference count. Uh, this is the architecture of our tool. Movic includes three parts, a preprocessor, an ST parser, and a recursive ST visitor. The ST visitor implements a source level instrumentation framework. This tool can uh, transform the input state source code into a uh, instrumented resulting source code with many uh, code snippets being inserted. It also generates the interfaces for the monitoring algorithm. And the interfaces are automatically included by the instrumented, so, uh, instrumented source code. You can compile the resulting source code using a C compiler, for example, GCC, and get a binary program. When you run this program, the monitoring algorithm inside the binary can automatically detect the memory errors at the runtime. Uh, now I will uh, demonstrate the tool uh, using another desktop. So I will uh, switch sharing and uh, switch to another desktop. Okay. Uh, so uh, I have some examples here. The first example is the one uh, in the slide. So you can see this is the same as the as the pro program in the slide. Uh, here we have a special error here. Now we okay. Now we input the the command. Our tool is implemented as a standalone command line tool. So we input the tool name and then we specify the input file and uh, specify the name of the output file and the option to check for memory safety. Then after we run this uh, command, we get uh, an, instrumented soft, uh, an instrumented source code here. This is uh, uh, similar to the original source, web, uh, source, source code with some code snippet being inserted. And also it uh, generates uh, interfaces in another two auxiliary files. It included the monitoring algorithm. Uh, then we can compile the generated uh, source code, the output file, and we run it. So you can see an error is reported at one time. It shows that at the line 13, there is a, there is a spatial error. So if you look at the original source code, indeed there is a, a, an error here. So if you want to eliminate this, uh, this error, you can, for example, modify the original source code by uh, by changing the subscript from one to zero. In this case, it, this program is safe. Uh, we save this uh, source code and we try it again. We run the tool again and compile the output and run the binary file. So this time, no error is reported. That shows uh, the program is safe now. Okay, uh, then we show another example. Uh, this example, it's a, uh, it contains a use, use after free error here. Uh, we use malloc to allocate a memory block here, and then uh, we use the point R uh, to point to this uh, this heap object. Then we free it, free this uh, heap object. Then we try to uh, use this memory to read it. So it's a typical use after free. Also, we use our tool to instrument it. We change the source code to use that tree. Then we compile the output and we run the binary file. So you can see an error is reported here at line uh, 14, there is a temporal error. So this is the same as, the, as what we see in the, in the source code. If you want to eliminate this, uh, if you want to eliminate this error, you can move, for example, this uh, uh, free statement to the last line, for example, here. Uh, now this program is safe because this use of the memory is before the deallocation. 
uh, we try to again. So this time no error is reported because now it's stable. And the third simple example is about a memory leak. Uh, here we allocated the two memory blocks. Then we free uh, we free one of them, but we didn't free the the second one until the end of the program. So there is a memory leak in the program. Uh, actually, at this line. So we try. and we compile the output and run the binary file. So you can see a memory leak is reported at runtime. So if you want to eliminate this, uh, this, uh, uh, this error, you can free the second memory block here, with demo 3 n Now the error is eliminated because two of the, the two memory, memory leaks are both uh, deallocated. So we try it again. So this time no error is reported, right? That means the program is safe now. Okay, uh, now I demonstrate a more, uh, more complex program, uh, a more real world program. This program uh, named the Blowfish, it includes uh, uh, several source code, many source code files here. And it has a make file to compile the, the program. So I I will show how to how to use our tool on this uh, complex project. Uh, first we go to the directory, then we use the bail command to make the project and generate a compiled database for this project. So if you go to the go to the uh, the directory. You can see there is a compile database in JSON format. It includes all the files compiled in this project. Then we use this uh, we use this file to direct our instrumentation. Okay, uh, so we input another another uh, command. So this time we specify the output directory instead of the instead of the output file because there are many files in this project. Okay. Uh, when it finishes, you can see there is the output directory here, and if you go into uh, this one, you can see there are uh, many C code being instrumented. So. You can see the code being instrumented here. Okay, then we compare it. Okay, when it finishes, you uh, we get the executable, executable file here, and then we can test it using the uh, using, for example, this uh, this command in the shell script. So we copy this part. This is the command for running the, the executable file. So we copy and paste it here. So you can see uh, eight errors have been reported at runtime. Both of the, uh, all the other errors are spatial errors. That means there are uh, buffer over overflows in the program. Uh, if you go to the original source file, uh, go to this line, uh, line uh, 52. Uh, you can see this error, uh, 52, uh, yeah, here. So this is the overflow, 952. Okay, uh, so that's all for the demonstration. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, I guess we have time for maybe one quick question, uh, if anyone has any. Um, yeah, maybe I can ask a question. So uh, you mentioned that you, uh, your paper, uh, your tool can actually detect multiple different, you know, uh, type of errors, right? So may I ask, what is the distribution? Have you have you done some analysis on the distribution of these different types of errors? 
uh, we have tested uh, uh, many benchmarks. I think most uh, the most uh, uh, often seen uh, errors are spatial errors like overflows, and uh, uh, this is the most uh, uh, mostly seen uh, errors. And the second one could be the memory leaks, because uh, you have to uh, if you want you want to if you want to avoid the memory leaks in your project, you have to uh, deallocate all the allocated uh, memories. But this is hard for programmers because they, this usually don't affect the functionality of your program. It's only affect, affect the memory usage. So it's usually uh, exist in your program. But I, we don't have a, 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 I say a formal uh, statistics on this uh, on this result. Yeah, it's only our, our experience. Hmm. See, got it. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we're ready to go to our final presentation. So Wing will be presenting uh, their work on IP flakies. Thanks. Do you see the full slideshow now, right? The full screen. I see the full screen. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'll be presenting our work on IP flakies, which is a framework for detecting and fixing Python order dependent flaky tests. Uh, this work was done by two students, Rushin and Yang, and myself, Wing. Uh, so before we get into kind of what the framework actually does, uh, let's take a moment to understand what order-dependent tests actually are. Um, order-dependent tests are essentially tests that pass and fail um, only due to the order in which the tests are run. So there's an example here on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, it's from an open source project. And to kind of make it easier to refer to them, we're going to refer to them as T1, T2, and T3. When we run T1 followed by T2, um, we'll see both tests direct, uh, both tests pass. When we run T2 and then T1, um, we'll see that T1 actually fails because of the assertion on line six. Um, when we then run T2, T3, and T1, we'll see actually all three tests are passing. Um, and largely we can see kind of from all, from all three of these tests that it all depends on some kind of container variable, kind of this, you know, con -con variable. Um, and they're all manipulating it or either reading from it. And there's kind of some dependency essentially among all three of these tests. Essentially, we refer to these three tests based on their behavior as victim, polluter, and cleaners. Specifically, a victim in this case fails when it's run directly after the polluter and unless there's actually cleaners that are actually run in between them, um, all other tests in the test suite would not affect the victim's result. So when it comes to detecting and fixing order dependent flaky tests, there is some related work. One of our prior work um, that was published in 2019 proposed an approach to automatically fix Java order dependent tests using these polluters and cleaners. Um, and so we'll be able to fix a test like the one we just looked at, that victim, um, using these polluters and cleaners. Uh, more recently, Gruber et al. actually proposed a data set um, last year where they actually detected 4,312 order dependent tests uh, among, 600, uh, uh, among more than 600 Python projects from open source. Um, the way these order dependent tests were detected was just from running these test suites randomly in in various different random orders. Uh, but what was missing from this data set was actually the polluter and cleaner information. And so in this work, uh, we actually propose a framework called IP flakies that aims at actually detecting and fixing these Python order dependent flaky tests. Specifically, our framework will detect and categorize uh, Python order dependent tests. Um, and then actually find the polluters and cleaners for victims and create patches um, in order to automatically fix them so that they're no longer order dependent. So IP flakies on a high level takes a Python project um, and then it actually gives it into a component called IP flakies, which will go and detect the order dependent tests. Um, once the order dependent tests are detected, um, their failing orders and passing orders along with the names of those order dependent tests are then given to ifix flakies, which would generate patches for these order dependent tests. When we open up these two components, what ID flakies does is it has a randomizer component which runs test suites in random orders. The execution results of these ran of running these random orders 
is then given into the analyzer, which analyzes the results and reruns some tests in order to verify um, the results and the categorizations. Um, what's finally outputted is the or is the order dependent tests that are detected along with the passing orders and the failing orders um, for these order dependent tests. This input or this output from IV flakies is then given as input to IFIX flakies. Specifically, when we open up IFIX flakies, we'll see that there's a minimizer component which runs tests through various algorithms. For an example, running every test individually before the order dependent tests. This is mainly to kind of to help us find tests that are related to these order dependent tests. So for an example, it's gonna help us find polluters for victims. These order dependent test related information is then given to the patcher in order to generate patches. And in the end, we get the order dependent test related information for any given order dependent tests, along with the patch to actually make these order dependent tests no longer be order dependent. So we'll switch briefly now to look at a demonstration. So here I have a project that's already cloned. In fact, this is the project from the slide, uh, from the second slide when I gave an example of an order dependent test. Um, for someone that's really uh, the first time they're trying to run IF IP flakies, they would have to do this pip install for IP flakies as well. But since I already have it installed on my machine, I can skip that step. Um, the next step then is really just to run IP flakies in these various random orders to detect order dependent tests. So here I have um, the actual invocation for IP flakies, um, telling IP flakies to then run for 30 iterations, um, so 30 random orders, along with a deterministic seed um, so that the orders, the random orders that are generated um, can be reproduced later. So when I run this, um, it's gonna start the randomizer component where it runs 30 randomized test suites. Um, and so here it's just going through the 30 different orders and collecting its results. Um, so after it finishes running, again, then it goes into the analyzer component. Um, in this case, it's found that this, uh, this victim, this test is actually a flaky test. And now it's checking whether or not it's an order dependent flaky test or if it's of some other category. Um, so here on line nine, we see now that it actually found the test to be order dependent and now it's categorizing it further. Is it actually a victim or is it some other type of order dependent test? And finally, it finds that it's actually a victim order dependent test. So all of this information is then written into a JSON file um, so that someone else can also parse it later. Um, once we have actually ran ID flakies, um, we then can actually invoke um, the ifix flake, ifix flakies part of IP flakies to go and generate a patch for the victim that was just detected. So we would actually just run IP flakies with the name of the victim. And then here it starts to actually go and find um, the polluters um, from the minimizer component. So in this case, it's actually found that there is actually three polluters um, for the victim. Um, specifically, it's these three tests that are listed here. Um, and now it goes and tries to find cleaners for the polluters. And so here it actually seems like it found one cleaner, or it found six cleaners, sorry, for this one polluter. Um, and so right now it's using this cleaner, these cleaners at least, in order to generate a patch. So here it tells you that this is actually the patch um, that we obtained from running the cleaner. Um, and again, this information is actually also outputted into a JSON file for someone to parse later. So switching back to our slides. Um, essentially on a high level, the usage of IP flakies is rather simple. In order to install IP flakies, you simply need to run pip install IP flakies, um, assuming you have your Python environment already set up. Um, then in order to run ID flaky to detect flaky, to detect order dependent flaky tests, you simply need to run 
Python 3-M IP flakies with some number of iteration. Um, there is some default of 100, um, of using 100 times, but you can set that if you want. And then finally, in order to use ifix flakies to fix um, order dependent tests, you simply need to call Python 3-M IP flakies with the name of the order dependent tests after this dash T argument. Um, there are a few other arguments um, that could be provided to IP flakies that I'll just briefly mention here. Um, one is called patch mode, which allows you to either get all the possible patches for an order dependent test or just the first one. The default is just to give you the first one. As I mentioned before, the dash I argument um, allows you to control how many orders uh, IP flakies will run the randomized test suites. Um, dash V will actually control how many times a specific order is rerun in order to verify that a test is actually order dependent and not because of some other causes like concurrency. And then finally, a C could be given to make sure that we generate deterministic randomized test suites. Um, I already kind of briefly mentioned the uh, output of ID flakies, but I'll just kind of quickly go over here again. Um, the first step really for ID flakies here um, is that it would check actually whether or not a, a flaky test that's found is actually not deterministic if it's because of concurrency or some other reasons, or if it's actually because of order dependency. Once it confirms that it is an order dependent test, we do additional categorization to see if it's a victim or a brittle. Um, and once it's found to be a victim, um, that gets saved um, into a JSON file. Uh, when it comes to running ifix flakies, um, it would first check whether or not a given test is actually order dependent or not. Um, it would then go and try to find the polluters. After it finds polluters, it goes and finds cleaners and generates a patch. Um, that's it for my presentation today. Uh, I'll take any questions now, thanks. All right, thank you very much, Wing. Uh, we have some time for questions, I guess this time just, just for Wing about any of the uh, things going on for here. Yeah, actually, uh, I have a quick question. So um, you mentioned that the randomizer and the patcher is it's like an exhaustive algorithm to find if there exists, you know, OD testing inside of test suite. And um, so my question is, is there any common indicators for the OD test? Um, so like first of all, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I just uh, want to mention like some state setters, you know, or some functionalities in the before or teardown methods. So such like indicators for, for some general, uh, you know, OD test. Yeah, so this possible kind of, uh, I'm, I'm still not 100% sure kind of what your question is asking, but the, if your question is about whether or not um, setup methods for kind of classes can actually cause tests to be order dependent or not, um, the answer is yes. Um, this especially matters more when you're, when you have order dependent tests that depends on some other tests in another class, right? That's where kind of setups and teardowns of different classes can affect um, whether or not a test is order dependent or not. Um, but even within the same test class, you can have setup and teardowns that also affects whether or not a test is order dependent. Okay, I guess uh, maybe the test order dependency is, uh, may, you know, and may, may be a result of multiple factors, right? So it's hard to say that there is some common indicators for the OD test, right? Yes, the maybe the again, I'm not 100% sure kind of where you're leading with this question, but the, mm -hmm. the point here may actually be the fact that a lot of times the fixes for these order dependent tests um, may not actually just be in setup or teardown methods. It could be in the tests themselves, it could be in these setups and teardown methods that you're pointing out. Um, it could mm -hmm. also just be in the code under test itself. Um, so those are kind of all possible places where the fixes could be. Um, the, this work largely looks at identifying fixes that are in the test code itself. Um, so in the test method body or in the setup and teardown methods. Um, it doesn't look for fixes in the code under test. Um, but the future work could kind of meaningfully look there um, to come up with fixes as well. You mean the code under test? You, you, you're referring to the production code, right? Yes, the production code, yes. See, got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe I have, I have one quick question actually before we jump to the general question thing. Uh, for example, this one, 
uh, more just a detailed thing, I guess, when you went step by step, you would first detect, and then you would, I guess the only way to go to the fix part is to pass the dash T option. But that assumes, I guess, the various like JSON files are already there for like the, the JSON files generated in the previous step. Uh, it has to be there before that can actually go through the minimizing and fixing. Um, it doesn't need that actually. So there, it, it's, as you can see from the argument, we only ask for the name of the test. We actually don't care if you have the JSON files there or not. Okay. okay yeah. So this is, so it just, oh, I see, because it doesn't need to know what the order that failed or anything like that. It just tries. Everything. Yeah, it's more like it tries again anyway to see whether or not the test is order dependent or not. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah, I can even briefly go back and show you. So here, um, it actually goes and checks kind of that this test is actually a victim. You see the, there's no line numbers here, but the, the kind of one, two, three, the third line of this output uh -huh. would run a check there anyway. Okay. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I think we are kind of finished with the general formal presentation aspect of this, uh, this session. So now I think we have the last uh, 15 minutes, we can do kind of more general Q and A for everybody here in the session. Um, so now I'm just gonna open the floor for kind of anything. Uh, I guess you guys have been asking questions to each other, so that's very helpful for me. Uh, but I do have questions of my own, actually. If no one else has any more questions, can I have you go first, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, um, so Xiao, I just want some questions about maybe uh, going back to Jay Mocker. Um, so I noticed that you, uh, you know, your example uh, was on Apache Jack Rabbit, so showing kind of the real code changes there. So that was really cool. Uh, I'm wondering, like, uh, did you end up sending kind of these refactorings to the developers as sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, suggestions, or and did you do that for any other projects? Or yeah, um, actually, it's, it's a great question. So uh, we, yes, the answer is yes. We did. Uh, submit some code review, not code review, uh, you know, pull request, mm -hmm. uh, pull request to the open source projects. I think we sent 18 pull requests to uh, like 10 open source projects, including some famous project like Log, Log42, uh, like Cassandra, something like that. Yeah, so um, their response, um, well, I, I would say like half of the pull request got accepted and mm -hmm. the feedback from the developers is uh, mentioned that um, the Jmarker uh, is actually refactoring the uh, inherit test to production inheritance by using Mercator, right? And um, it's um, it's enable the back uh, the for uh, I should say it is make the code more readable and uh, easy to maintenance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and other uh, other developers is not appreciate for this, uh, this kind of refactoring um, because sometimes they think that, um, well, this is just one case that using the, uh, the test production inheritance. And if, if we are, we are introduced like a mocking framework just for this one particular case, maybe it, mm -hmm. it is not worth to do it. Um, and also some developers just prefer inheritance over mock. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, uh, that is um, yeah that we, uh, is what, what we do for the pull request. Okay, thank you. Um, another question I had was uh, concerning the mocking kind of details itself. I guess you have to your 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 factoring works when they already have a certain pattern in place with like this inheritance uh, that they're already doing and they're testing. Uh, I just want you know do a better mocking solution for it. Like, is it also possible to use some of the similar ideas here to do kind of generate mocks almost like from scratch if no one is actually doing this kind of inheritance for the testing can you introduce mocks for like a fresh project just to you know help them with better testing practice well uh that is a great question so if uh so first if the developers didn't use any methodology for mocking as an inheritance mock or you know through some mocking frameworks then it has to be integration test, right? Or they are trying to write unit tests, but they fail to isolate the dependencies among different software components that leads to an integration test in the end, right? So um, if that is the case, I think, uh, uh, well, first it, it should be a different project, a separate project, because first we need to identify whether they are actually using the, uh, you know, the extra class instead of a mocking class, right? 
And once we determine, okay, this should be a unit test instead of an integration test, then we can see that what is the test target inside of the, this unit test. Once we identify the test target, we are able to isolate the dependencies that's supposed to be marked, right? So mm -hmm. the other is, uh, yes, um, I think that's definitely an interesting field in the future. So mm -hmm. um, it's definitely uh, could you know raise more attention because okay. uh, the unit test, the core of unit test is isolating the dependencies. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have more questions, but for other people as well. But uh, <laughs> uh, so, if you don't mind, I can keep asking questions. <laughs> I have plenty. Uh, so I have a question actually for Je about the uh, Mobic. Um, so I'm curious, kind of um, how how high have you gotten to Mobic to kind of scale? Like how big of a project? Uh, does it work? Does it, do you imagine that it works for just like any size kind of C C++ kind of program, or is there like, a, or does it get kind of get a point where like there's a lot of overhead or something in in the process? Uh, okay. Um, about the the size of the benchmarks, we we have tested many uh, benchmarks. I think the largest uh, program include. Uh, uh, include, I think uh, it's about. Uh, 50,000 50, lines of CC code. Uh, I think the, most, the biggest challenge for, it, for our tool is you, we have to, to solve many corner cases of the C programs. Uh, because you know, C include very, very uh, they involve very complex syntax. Yeah. Uh, if you write a very small program, you only use some very simple syntax and uh, if you, you uh, if you want to, for example, if you want to you want to process a large program like GCC, you may need to uh, handle some very complex uh, syntax or, or very uh, very uh, tricky usage of the syntax. So uh, the biggest challenge for our tool is to handle these corner cases. And uh, one big difference between our tool and, uh, for example, Google's address syntax is that we perform source level instrumentation. But the the adjacent tether they use uh, 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 IR level instrumentation. So we are facing a uh, uh, more complex syntax than uh, IR. So most of our work uh, have been uh, has been the to 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 handle these corner cases. Uh, about the overhead problem, uh, usually we uh, the, the dynamic analysis tool usually uh, uh, incurs. Uh, I think. Uh, Two or three times uh, for 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 the uh, for, for the overhead, and uh, for our tool, uh, the overhead could be more higher because uh, we we uh, check for more types of memory errors. Uh, if you check for less errors, the overhead would be lower. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This uh, is yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, follow up at one point you mentioned, like you know how you're doing source mode instrumentation. May I ask kind of. The, mo the main motivation for that instead of doing, let's say, the IR based as the other tool is doing. Yeah, IR based means uh, you you uh, the first uh, the implementation is more simple because you only need to handle uh, a very simple syntax for the IR language, and the benefit is that if you uh, if you uh, treat uh, if you handle the IR code, that means you can uh, you can handle many program languages. Provided that the program language can be translated into the IR code, however, uh, they also have some drawbacks. For example, uh, uh, it uh, depends on some specific IR language and some specific compiler. So you can't support some specific operating systems and the ISAs, uh, especially in the embedded software uh, field. Uh, and another drawback for IR level instrumentation is that. It's optimization uh, sensitive. Sensitive, uh, for example, uh, for for Google Search Snyder, it can detect some errors at the optimization level. For example, O zero when when optimizations are turned off. However, when you open the optimization, for example, at O one, O two, or O three, then it can't detect the error any longer. So these are the main drawbacks for IR level instrumentation. Yeah. Okay, I see. I understand. Okay. Um, and one, one like uh, maybe maybe quick question I guess is that I, I noticed from your you know examples uh, they would print out like you know the categories like spatial or, or sorry temporal uh, errors and I guess 
Uh, I guess since you kind of knew the examples, you knew how exactly how to fix them. So I was kind of curious. So you see like these kind of these messages were they very useful and like debugging and then repairing, especially for like bigger and bigger programs when you might see lots and lots of errors. Uh, uh, so our tool is mainly used for testing papers. So if you see this such a, a narrow, you may need to uh, look into the source code. Uh, because we, we mentioned the, the, the line number and the corner number and the source file name of your error. So this depends on the scale of the programmers to, to find out the, the source of the error. We only give the, 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 uh, the, the location of the error where the, the error is found. And also it, it cheated. So uh -huh. you need to find the source of the code yourself. Yeah. I see. I think this is, uh, this is common for all the testing tools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they'll give some hints, but uh, doesn't kick it all the way. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, I can keep going. I have questions for Wing too. <laughs> so, uh, so I actually, yeah, so I'm taking my advantage of my position as chair to ask my questions. Uh, so Wing, actually, uh, I guess you're working uh, this tool. IP Flakies works for Python specifically, right? For detecting and fixing Python flaky tests. Order dependently a test. I was curious, you know, uh, compared to the prior work on, on Java, like what would you say are like the fun, like, you know, any interesting or fundamental things you notice differences in kind of the way these flaky tests in Python are like and perhaps how they actually get repaired uh, in, in comparison to Java? Yeah, so there's some differences that are mentioned in the paper. Um, I can point to maybe kind of one of them. Um, the, I mean, first thing, there's kind of tool differences, which doesn't seem like exactly what you're asking, kind of, you know, the tools that we have on the Python side and the tools we have on Java side. There's some subtle differences between them. We can chat about that if you're interested. Um, but what you're asking more fundamentally seems to be kind of for the order dependent tests that are in Python, how do they differ kind of from the order dependent tests in Java? Mm -hmm. um, so for kind of this latter question specifically, um, one of the things that we noticed that was quite interesting is actually on parameterized unit tests. So mm -hmm. that actually seems to be much more common um, in Python than it is in Java, which in that case is, meant, is referred to as theories. But uh, there's much less of those, um, at least in our work, um, our prior work on Java order dependent tests, we never really explored how different parameters may actually cause tests to be more or less flaky. Um, but we did observe this to be the case actually for Python, where some parameters specifically seemingly were what was causing it to be flaky, while some other parameters seemingly were not flaky. So we would need to actually inspect that in greater detail and actually kind of refine that more. But uh, this would be kind of one fundamental difference between kind of Python flaky tests that we have noticed compared to kind of Java ones. Mm -hmm. um, this line of questioning is rather interesting. There's lots of work that could be done. This work obviously expands even to other programming languages, um, kind of what are the types that are more or less often, what are kind of the fixes that may be more or less you know, relevant. Um, but yes, very good question. And did you notice kind of roughly maybe the same percentage of like this, cave, like, you know, the, the, the like polluter, victim, cleaner, like roughly the same percentage of cases where they had them or not had them or how many? Of, of such cases compared to Java? So we discussed some of that information already in the paper as well. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head how the numbers directly compare. Um, they, I think the numbers do differ um, by a bit, but I don't remember off the top of my head the exact numbers at this point. Okay. They are mentioned sure. in the paper. It is also publicly available in the data set. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, I want to get, yeah, maybe give a chance in case there are more questions for anybody uh, in the last, I guess we have just a few more minutes left. Uh, so any more questions we have for each other or the audience? <laughs> yeah, actually I have a, a small question for Drew. So, um, so I think uh, your tool is focused on same language, right? So. Um, so is there any like memory errors that's specific to uh, C language? Because I, I saw that uh, some errors are related to memory free uh, mechanism, right? It, it's handled differently in other languages such like Java, right? So Java has its own garbage collector to you know, uh, free the memory for developers. So is that 
something uh, the, the the memory errors is that specific to C language or it also exists in other uh, programs? Program uh, yeah, 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 that's a good question. Um, uh, I think the memory errors uh, is more important for 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 the low level languages. I mean, I mean, low level means that uh, the language can control your memory.